Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly Beatles program that focuses on what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for the syndicated radio program called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner, and millions of other examiners himself, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. uh, Hello, everybody. On, uh, On today's show, we have a very special guest who is actually physically here at the radio station as we speak. Very special to us. All of us Beatle fans, because we share so much of a history going back to the 60s with him. His name, Billy J. Kramer. Hi, Billy. Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm doing fine. And uh, the reason why we're here is not only to talk about the past, but you have a brand new CD out. Uh And it's called I Won the Fight. Yes. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the material on there. Uh, My first question to you is, I know that you've been working on this for a few years. Um, No, I haven't. Sure you have. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've known. Give me a hard time here. No. I, I've uh, actually... Uh, You've been talking about having new material for I've quite been, a while. Yeah, I've been talking about doing new material for a long time. And uh, when I lived in England, uh, I did a lot of things that didn't go, come across here to the United States. Hmm. And, but since I came here, I, I, haven't, I never really got into it, you know. Okay. So how long have you been working on this new album? Um, I'd say eight or nine months. Well, I'm very impressed with the material on here, and especially the the sound quality. Right. And the one thing that leaps at me that I have to ask you about first, because there's ten songs on here. Right. And five of them you've either written or co-written. Right. And we haven't known you as being a songwriter. Is this more of a new thing for you? Um, When I was with the Dakotas, I used to help them a little Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I had John and Paul, and then I had Mort Schumann and Bert Bankerak and people like that, and it sort of never occurred to me. And then I, one day, uh, about a year ago, thought maybe I should do something special, because I thought, like, the anniversary's coming around, 50 years, and uh, maybe I should do something special for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I uh, started to play guitar again, which I hadn't done in many years. Right. And um, just one thing led to another, you know. It was uh, it was great. Yeah. Do you find songwriting easy? Some of it's easy, some of it's very hard. You know, it's very frustrating sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, especially when you, uh, sometimes you might write a song and uh, you might be looking around for a couple of months just for a couple of words that you feel are the right ones for a particular thing, you know. Right. Sometimes yeah. you need inspiration. Yeah, you know, it's fu- it's very funny because, like, the song Liverpool with Love, you know, I had the line, like, football noise and teddy boys. Right. And but my wife said teddy boys. You know, I said, I, I thought of the whole song, uh, but I said, like, football noise. And, and she said, why don't you say teddy boys? And I said, that's great. She said, I want a piece of it. Yeah, she's not listed as a co-writer. <laughs> What's going on here, Billy? <laughs> have you... Have you um on the road that uh, that Ringo has, where you would rather talk about your life through your music, or have you have you considered writing a book at this point, Billy? Um, I, you know, I've thought about writing a book um, for quite a while, and I have a lot of notes that I've uh, put down over the, the past few years. And um, I don't know. I, I, I I'm going to get around to it next. I think. You know, <laughs> I was waiting for all the sex and drugs and rock and roll books to get out the way. Mm-hmm. And then I'd, I'd write a book with uh, some real substance in it, you know. I know several people that would love to help you with your with your book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everyone listening is raising their hand right now. Yeah, <laughs> everybody, everybody. How does fifty years feel, Bill? Billy? I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's it's actually hard to believe that it's been that we're getting on fifty years, you know, from the from the. Well, um, you know, it, it's, it's over, Joe, and, and I mean, how does that feel to you, though? How does it feel? It's, you know, it, 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 I feel wonderful, you know. I'm uh, very happy that I'm in good shape and I can still do what I do today, you know. Yeah, to me, it was like really weird because, I mean, uh, I think it was this month, uh, 50 years ago, that Do You Want to Know a Secret was number one in England for me. Wow. Mm. You know. Wow. And I kind of felt weird singing it on stage at the fest a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. You know, 
Um, you know, Steve just mentioned um, Ringo and the path that he's followed writing autobiographical songs in some of his most recent material and, and mentioning Liverpool. Liverpool's in the title of three of Ringo's songs now. And you bring up Liverpool a lot on this new CD. And um, it's just, I, I find a similarity there. It's very endearing to me because you're addressing how proud you are of your past. And uh, one of the things that I do want to talk to you about, because you mentioned his name twice in songs here, yes. is Brian Epstein. In right. fact, on the, the back cover, okay. we even dedicate the album to Brian. That's right. So uh, you've been very vocal lately about Brian wanting him to get credit and that he deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which you even say in, in your song, yes. To Liverpool With Love. Right. Tell, me, tell us all how you feel about this. I just think that it's a, a big injustice. I think Brian Epstein brought the Beatles to the world. Mm -hmm. They're the biggest rock and roll band that's ever happened. Fifty years later, they're the biggest band. There's never going to be another thing like the Beatles. It was a fun, phenomenon. And um, only for Brian pounding the pavements in London and getting them a record deal and then bringing them over here to the United States and putting them on Ed Sullivan... Uh, the world could have missed one of the greatest periods in in its history. That's right. A lot of people just don't acknowledge that to get to point B, you need point A. You uh, need people in the very a. beginning to give you those breaks. Absolutely. You know, and Brian was the perfect representative. You know, um, he was a gentleman. And he was a class act, and um, he, he deserves it. You know, it's just, to me, it's it's a absolute stupidity. You refer to him on the back cover as your mentor. Well, I, you know, Brian was like, um, he gave me a lot of advice, you know, I, I like about what my dress and, you know, different things. Because you know. mm. I was just a blue collar worker's son, you know, I'd never been anywhere. Ne you know, we didn't go on vacations. We lived in a, a council house, you know, um, and getting onto the, the level which I did, um, it was a lot of adjustment in the early days, you know. Right. And Brian helped me along. You know, he right away formed a company for me and took care of things. You know, you know, I don't think there's a managers around today like Brian. It was, it was amazing. You know, it's simple things like, you know, it was, I was on the road with the Dakotas at the time, and we would get this package every week that would be so much cash for each of us, and the rest went to our accountants, and that there'd be a whole rundown of expenses, hotels, and the, Mm. and an itinerary, and, and it was very, very professionally done, you know. Yeah. I'm sure it's different now, but um, for back then, you know, it was something. You know, I mean, the what? the business, the rock and roll business really was in its infancy then, you know. What's, what's kind of interesting is that Brian came from running NEMS to to managing, you know, the, the greatest rock and roll band that, that had ever lived, and I'm just wondering, Billy, what, did you know him? before he managed the Beatles? Um, no, I didn't. Um, I met Brian just because I used to come around with the Beatles, you know, and um, I met Brian for the first time when I, I came third in the popularity ball in Mersey Beat, and we did a concert, you know, when we were all given some sort of egg cup or something. <laughs> I can't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that was when I first met Brian. And then I used to see him on gigs with the Beatles. And then he used to book me a lot through it. I had a manager called Ted Nibbs, and he was very friendly with Brian. And um, I used to get a lot of jobs around Liverpool opening for them. Did Brian independently decide to sign you, or was it with a little bit of the pushing of the Beatles? I don't know that. I was just glad he did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I um, you know, it was something that I... I when I was younger, I never really considered it. You know, I was in engineering, and I was going to pack it in and go and work for Rolls-Royce for a while and stuff like that. And then Brian came along, and I'll be honest with you, out of all the people that were around at that time, he was the only person um, that, that I felt I would take a chance with. Hmm. Yeah. And why was that? Because you felt you could trust him? I felt I could trust him, and I saw what he was doing for the Beatles, you know. I remember many years ago you told me that one thing that stood out was um, he cared enough about you. One time your mother was ill, and he called to find out about that. Just um, little things like that. He, you know, I mean, like he, when my mother passed, he came and took my father out to dinner and stuff like that. You know, he was very, very, very thoughtful in a lot of ways. 
and you know he was uh he would come to shows and critique them he'd arrive and not tell you and then he'd come backstage afterwards and say you know i didn't like the way you introduced that song billy why didn't you do it this way um you know the suit you're wearing is the wrong color it doesn't look good on this light and you know he'd go through the whole thing you know, um, he was very involved in every aspect yes. of your presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he did the same. Yeah, I mean he he did it. For, we know he did it for the Beatles, and it's, it's interesting that he he went along that route with you too, Billy. Absolutely. You know, we all had to bow and you know, hmm. and do all that kind of stuff. Bill Harry tells a story that actually that John Lennon was the inspiration for you to change your name. Is that is that true? Uh, no, um, I was uh, the band I was with wanted me to call. Th th they said you got to have a stage name, and they came up with Billy Kramer. And when I was just about to bring out the order of a secret, John Lennon, um, I went to Brian's office one day, and John was there, and he said, uh, "Brian said I have a suggestion. Um, John thinks you should call yourself Billy J. Kramer." And I said, "Thank you very much. It's a great idea." Hmm. <laughs> you know. Now, isn't it true that, that the J was for Julian, for a song? I, I, yes, it was, and I didn't know at the time he had a song called Julian. Right. You know, I, I was out of that picture. Yeah. Well, before we talk about this new album a little more, I just want to clear up a few things, because I know a lot of Beatle fans care a lot about the songs that you recorded that were John and Paul songs, and um, just recently I, I saw Peter Asher in concert, right. and he was talking about A World Without Love. Right. And on stage he said, I'm not sure, I think that Paul may have offered that to Billy Jay before me. So uh, did he? No. Uh, you know, quite frankly, I've seen pictures on the internet, and I've seen it mentioned in magazines and things, and I never heard that song before. I heard it when they made a, a hit record out of it. I didn't, didn't hear it. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad to c clarify that, you know, because it's yeah. a, you know... Well, if Peter says it, you know, you're going to, uh, it carries a lot of weight, so. Does it really? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Let's start a war here. No, well. Yeah, yeah really. I um, will win the war. Uh, <laughs> well, you won the fight. I did. But I'm, but That's right. Um, good. I've yeah. also read that the song One and One is Two, which is not exactly uh, a song that a lot of Beatle fans are crazy about, mm -hmm. of songs that they gave away, right. was offered to you also. Um, there were three songs and I'll be honest with you and this is the God's honest truth I couldn't believe they'd written such mad songs one of them was one and one is two and there was two others and um, I, I didn't like them at all I thought this is not like what I've heard in the past what were the other two I can't remember <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember you know and I'll be honest with you by the, at this point I was uh, into recording little children right you know, which um, was a big hit for me. Now, the demos that were made, the only ones that I'm aware of is the one John made for Bad to Me. There was no demo. Well, it circulated for a long time with John on acoustic guitar singing it. Well, you know, um, you know this is something which is not annoying, but, you know, uh, John Lennon sat me down at EMI when I was... Uh, I'd been on a show with them in Bournemouth, and he said, I've got a song for you. And I said... Will you play it? And he says, no, I'll, I'll see you at Abbey Road. Now, I never thought he'd show. And it was my 20th birthday, and he came to Abbey Road about a week or two later, and he sat at the piano and played Bad to Me. There was no demo. We learned the song in the studio and recorded it. Hmm. Maybe he just recorded it for himself. I don't know. He may, may have done, but, you know, that's how I first heard the song. I, you know, uh, and... Uh, so it's hard to learn a song like that, you know, back then and r record it in the time that you were allotted. Um, at the same time, you played I Want to Hold Your Hand. Mm -hmm. And I said, can I have that one? And he said, no, we're doing that ourselves. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I never had a demo, you know. Right. I never had a demo for I'll Keep You Satisfied, I Call Your Name, From a Window. Right. None of the songs. But do you want to know a secret? There was a demo. Uh, there was just John. Uh, John on an acoustic guitar. That was all I had. Now, haven't you told this story where at the very end he's flushing a toilet? That's right. Yeah. That was it. That Brian gave me a tape with uh, Do You Want to Know a Secret? On. How was it? I mean, we know about the songs that became the A-sides to your singles that John and Paul wrote. You also recorded I'll Be On My Way. Yes. Was that intended to be an A-side or a hit in any way? We just, at the time, we just uh, wanted a B-side. 
Um, the Dakotas were really into writing then. We, you know, things happened so fast because we, we went to EMI and recorded uh, Do You Want to Know a Secret? And I didn't think it was very good. And then Brian called me about two weeks later and said, you know, George Martin wants to release it. And I said, I thought that was only like a test or a demo. Mm -hmm. And we w went back down to Abbey Road and um, finished it. And we did the B-side. And um, I was very uh, taken back when Do You Want a Secret was a big hit. I was glad, of course. Sure. Launched everything for you. Yes. And you have to feel very proud of the fact, not only because of your Beatle association, but the Beatles really gave you more material than anybody. I mean, there's Peter and Gordon, and right. they have the f they have four songs there, and Scylla Black had three. Right. But once you add, not only do you want to know a secret, but I'll keep you satisfied, bad to me, yeah. um, from a window, I'll be on my way, I call your name, there's a lot of material there. I'm, I'm, I feel very blessed that I have them songs. You know, um, I really do. You know, I mean... Uh, they gave me a lot of help, you know, and um, they gave me a big push in the beginning. But they gave I it to you more than anybody, really. Well, maybe they like me. <laughs> <laughs> You're very likable. Billy, let me ask a question. Um, I talked to um, Peter Asher about a year ago, and he said that they preferred the mono mixes of their material over the stereo. And I've always really liked your stereo mixes, and I'm wondering if you feel the same way. Was the, were the mono mixes on your material better, you know, your preferred sounds rather than the stereo? Um, I, I liked mono. You know, I liked mono records. Back mm -hmm. then, you know, I did. I, thought they sh I always thought they should be left that way, you know. They were good and that was it, you know. It's, you know, mixing things and remixing them and putting them onto CDs and... Yeah. I can go either way, you know, with a lot of stuff from the 60s especially, because right. so, so much that's in stereo, you've got the vocals in one channel, and it, it it's, mm -hmm. gets buried, and some, some singles sound awful in stereo. Awful. Right. <laughs> right. You know? some, of the some of the Beatles singles sound really bad in stereo for that matter. Yeah. yeah. I've never, I'll be honest with you, I've never really studied that. I, I just made records, you know. Right. <laughs> uh, actually, under the supervision of other people until I made this new CD, you know. Hmm. Because my albums were strictly just a few, with a couple of hits, and the rest were just fillers. You know, I never, I always say to people, really, this is the first time I've sat down and said I'm going to make an album. Who worked with you on the new CD? Me. Just you? <laughs> <laughs> I used other people, yes. I used people like Liberty DeVito. Yeah. Does uh, a great job. You know, I used uh, Billy Sullivan, a guitar player from uh, Chicago. I used Billy Kinsley, who was with the Mersey Beats, to do vocal backings. I used another guitar player, Don Salenza. Um, you know. When you've performed in recent years, you've had Liberty in your band. How did you hook up with him? Um, I was at a gig one day, and I just walked up to him and said, would you like to do some shows with me? Because I think you're a great drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, He's got a very impressive resume. <laughs> right. And he, and he said yes. He said yes. And, um, I've been doing shows with him ever since, and he's he's a wonderful person to work with. He's great. Yeah, I got to tell you, I just saw you recently at the Fest for Beatle Fans, and apart from loving your performance, on on the Sunday, the drummer in the house band Liverpool couldn't be there, so Liberty did the drumming yes. for all the Beatles songs, and he looked like he was a little kid in heaven. Uh, <laughs> I, I just think he's amazing. You know, he's like a he's like a train. Uh huh. You know, he's. Uh, He's very fit, and he's very fast, and he's just incredible, you know. And he knows Ringo's parts really well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, he's a big Ringo fan, you know. He loves Ringo. Obviously. Because it was Ringo, you know, he said it was Ringo when he was a kid. He saw Ringo when he was a seven on, on Ed Sullivan and thought, you know, I'm gonna, that's what I want to do. Right. Yeah. Tell us about some of the songs on the new album. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that you've got uh, Lou Christie. Helping yeah. you out on background vocals. You've been good friends with him for a while. Yeah, for uh, 30 years. Yeah. I invited him along and he came and did his bit, you know. Mm hmm. I'm Christine Allman. Christine Allman, you know, I did a duet with Christine. I've known her. And I just fancied doing, you know, doing a duet and um, I called her up and um, 
she said she'd be on it. And, you know, I was kind of surprised. <laughs> right. And she came and uh, we put it together. Yeah. Tell me some of the songs that are most meaningful to you on this album. Obviously, you've got the autobiographical stuff. You're going through your history. You mentioned John and Paul in, uh, I guess it was the first song, I Won the Fight. Yeah. You know, and, and obviously Brian. And you talk about how proud you are, and you do it all over again if you had the chance. Absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, you know, people who've been in this business as long as I have, I mean, you know, it's it's a hard business. You have your ups and downs, and it's it's just life. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, um, in spite of everything that's gone on in my life, I would do it all again. Yeah, well, Without you've had question. an incredible life. Pardon? You've had an incredible life. Well, yeah, I, you know, it's it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun, uh, times a lot of heartache. You know, it's it's life. Mm -hmm. So, what songs would you pinpoint as being really important to you? I think uh, I like "Sunsets of Santa Fe." Um, I think you know, um, even though I wrote it, I think it's a good song. <laughs> Why would you say that? Even though I wrote it, because I do. You know, because it took a lot of doing. You know, it's it's hard to write a song and and and. Um, keep out the words like sun and moon and stars and blue skies mm -hmm. and, and sit down and spend a few weeks and months trying to come up with something different it's a, you know it's a real challenge sure it was you know i i just a neighbor of mine in santa fe because i have a house there was kept saying you know you never hear when there's these great sunsets billy you know sunsets of santa fe and i thought i'm going to write a song about that and i did you know yeah. I think that um, You Can't Live on Memories yes. is a very important song for you. Yeah. You tell us I, why. I, I, think it's, I think it's a very honest song, you know. I, I think it's, you know, I think the whole thing is a good record, even though I say it myself. I don't like blowing off about it, but I, uh -huh. I think it's a good, I'm very happy with it, very pleased with it. Um, people seem to be responding to it very well. You know, it's, it's a good feeling. I was curious... Uh, about uh, a couple of songs. Number one, the the lyrics to "Breakfast in Marin" caught my eye, yeah. caught my ear because I'm I'm close to Marin. Yes. What uh, attracted you to that song? Believe it or not, it wasn't the lyrical content. It's just I thought it was a very catchy tune. Okay. And it's a good one to sing. And I always thought it'd be a you know a lot of these things you know um, the songs that are good to do in studios and the songs to do live and, and i did think about that when i made this cd uh, it's a song i've always wanted to do live mm. you know that that's what enticed me to it you did a uh, a cover to bird pack rack song uh, story of my life yes um i did story of my life because of uh um i just sat in the studio one day and played it to the other musicians and they liked it and they'd never heard it before mm -hmm. <laughs> And I said, well, it, it was a number one hit in England when I was a kid for a guy called Michael Holiday. And he's, he was a great singer, and I never thought he ever got the, um, the credit that he deserved. And I thought it'd be nice to, to do it for him. And then you redid I'm in Love, which I've always thought was one of your best tracks from the early days. And well, I, you know, I'm in Love was a thing that, that happened when one day I was uh, at EMI and John came and said, I've got this great song. And um, uh, we had about 15 minutes left and we put two tracks down and that was the end of it. It was shelved and we just, you know, everybody, that life was at the speed of sound then. Mm. And I, I never really got into it. And I, um, you know, I heard like the foremost did it and people like that. And I never thought that I'd done it real justice. And... You know, I I didn't like the fact that EMI put it out when I had a box set come out. And the only reason they put it out really was because John and I were talking on it. And, mm -hmm. I, thought, and I thought that was cheaper than to mm. tell you the truth. It's also hard to hear what you're saying to each other. Um, it's kind of faint in the background. It's a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, there was a single CD that EMI put out. Was it really? Well, yeah. I, I only heard it on the, you know, I was sat in a restaurant one day when I heard it like, 40 years later right i hadn't heard it and, and i always thought that i wanted to go back and revisit and do it the way i felt it should have been mm. done. why and didn't you go back in the 60s and 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 i knew it then i never thought about it believe it or not so it was offered to you first yes absolutely okay yeah it's just the way it is i also wanted to ask 
Um, I call your name. Very interesting situation there with your recording because your version came out about nine months before the Beatles version came out. That's right. So there are those situations in Beatle history like you did, Do You Want to Know a Secret? The Beatles also recorded their version. Right. The Stones did I Want to Be Your Man. The Beatles did I Want to Be Your Man. That kind of situation. But, you know, why was there... Was it when it was given to you, it was specifically for you? You didn't have any idea that they were thinking about doing it themselves? Not at all. I mean, I'll be honest with you. When I recorded um, I Call Your Name, it was the same day as Bad to Me, and we were having a hard time. Uh, George Martin was was um, telling me the key of the song, and I was telling him what I felt it should be. And, you know, he wanted me to record it in the key of E, and it just wasn't coming together. Mm-hmm. And eventually, he let me have my way, and I did it in D, and it, it all came together. But we, we kind of like, uh, in the lunchtime of that session, we went off, and when we came back, I said, George, I'm getting fed up with that song, doing it over and over again. Uh, can we do the B-side and give it a rest? And we did I Call Your Name, and, and at the time, I thought it was good enough. I, I wanted it to be an A-side. Let's, I said, let's find another B-side. Mm-hmm. And he said, you sound too much like John Lennon. And I said, well, that's not a bad thing, George. <laughs> you know, and, um, the, you know, he, he said, you know, you're, no, you're Billy J. Kramer. And um, we went back to bed to me and it came together. So that's, that was the history of that. Yeah. And, you know, so many of the songs that the Beatles wrote for other people, I could hear the Beatles doing themselves. I mean, Bad to Me definitely is one of those songs. I could hear John do that with the Beatles backing him up. Yeah. Some of those songs were really strong songs. They weren't just, in, in the case of a lot of people think a lot of it were throwaways. Some of them were, was really strong material. Well, you know, I mean, I, it, it, I kind of uh, felt like insulted when EMI put out that album and said that the songs the Beatles threw away. And as far as I was concerned, you know, there were songs that were presented to me by them. And I think I'd done them justice and done a good job on them. Oh, definitely. You know. I love all those, all uh, those songs. I, I really, believe it or not, I really like I'll Keep You Satisfied. I thought it was a, it, 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 as a record, it was a, a much better record than my early ones. And, and from a window was as well. Yeah. Because I was getting more relaxed in the studio and uh, doing a better job, you know. So if people want to buy your new CD, they can go to your website, which right. is? BillyJKramer.com. Very easy to remember. Now, uh, will this be available on Amazon? It's going to be on Amazon and iTunes very soon. And is there any way now, if uh, fans want to check out individual tracks, if they want to stream it, is there a way to do so? There, there are tracks up on my website. Okay. Pieces of them. All right, so it's been great having you here, Billy. Thank you. I would highly recommend to all of our listeners to pick it up, the new CD called I Won the Fight. And uh, Billy J. Kramer, it's been a delight having you on Things We Said Today. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. And if any of you want to get in touch with us, you can do so by writing to us at our email address, which is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. You can also find out more about me and my show, Every Little Thing, at my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And if people want to get in touch with Steve, they can do so how? They can go to Examiner.com and look for my name, uh, Steve Marinucci, or uh, I'm also on Facebook. And uh, connect up with me, and, and we're talking a lot about the Paul McCartney tour, so I'm there. Okay, we're out there. <laughs> we're out there. We're definitely out there. Definitely out there. Billy, thank you again. This has been, this has been great. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So, for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you next time. And this is Billy J. Kramer. It's been a pleasure to be here today, and go out and buy it. I won the fight. BillyJKramer.com. <laughs>